On today's episode, we take a look at some new baits that are finally hitting store shelves near you, a pro angler has his truck stolen, and we crack open the mailbag to answer a ton of your fishing questions about winter lures, blade baits, and the Googans. All that and more on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello everybody, I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. Before we get started today, we are brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. ALF is my absolute favorite site on the entire internet to buy gear from for three specific reasons. One, they have the best customer service in the industry, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Number two, they have the most reliable shipping. My orders get to me quick, they're correct, it's not damaged, and if for some reason it is damaged, say you get a rod that's like snapped in two or something, they send you a new one before you even send the broken one back. That's why you choose American Legacy Fishing. But third, for us penny pinchers out there, American Legacy Fishing just simply has the best sales. ALF runs constant sales all the time to make sure that you're getting the best price on your gear, complete with a price match guarantee in writing. So if you see a better sale somewhere else, they will match it. But to be honest, that rarely happens because the boys at ALF run fantastic sales. Like right now, 12 days of Christmas sale going on over on the website, $50 sign up bonus when you sign up for an elite membership making it basically free. They're running 35% off Costa sunglasses, 20% off Yamamoto, 10% off all gift cards, 30% off Fireline and Spiderwire, 20% off Z-Man, 30% off select used gear, and we still have five days to go of deals that need to be revealed. That right there is why you fish at ALF. So head over to www.americanlegacyfishing.com to take advantage of the 12 days of Christmas sale going on right now. And as always, be sure to use code TACKLETALK10 for 10% off anything not already on sale. Some exclusions apply, not many, almost everything on that website. 10% off with code TACKLETALK10 over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com. All right, folks, we are back today with a normal episode of Tackle Talk after last week's Swimmy Awards. We had the second annual Swimmy Awards last week. Again, thank you guys so much for your emails, for your messages. I'm glad you guys enjoyed them. Hopefully you got a few laughs out of it. I appreciate everybody being a good sport, whether you were a winner, a loser, you knew somebody that was included. Again, it's kind of nice to have like one episode a year where we get to kind of let loose and crack a couple jokes. So I appreciate all the messages. Thank you guys so much. But today we are back with a normal episode of Tackle Talk. And to start off, we have a new gear alert. So right now, the Rapala Crush City soft plastics are finally hitting store shelves. I know our local stores got them this past weekend, at least the first three of them. They didn't have all of them, but here in Ohio, we saw the Freeloader, the Ned BLT, and the Cleanup Craw finally make their long-awaited appearance. So we didn't have a mayor, we didn't have the Bronco bug here, but we did have three of the five finally show up, and I know those other ones are showing up other places because I've seen pictures. So if you don't have them available yet, they likely will be soon. And we We've already touched on these baits, obviously, in our iCast episode this past year. We talked to Jacob Wheeler, who helped design these baits, about kind of the thought that went into each of these five, and I got to see the samples firsthand on the iCast show floor, the very first kind of production runs of them, but now we're actually finally seeing the mass-produced versions finally hit store shelves, and they're objectively impressive. So the quality of each bait, the clamshell protection, I really like the colors, the competitive pricing is really nice. They did a really good job with these baits. And one of the things I've always loved about people like Strike King is a really good example with the Rage Plastics is the packaging and the protection of the integrity of the bait and ensuring that each of those baits is absolutely perfect when you open them up for the first time. And then back in the day, we saw Guggen kind of take this same approach and the same model and we saw how insanely popular those plastics were. And now Rapala 
is kind of continuing that trend, which again, I love to see. I love the fact that every single time I'm opening this pack, the bait is perfect. So I'm one of those guys that would almost pay like a dollar, two dollars more a pack to ensure that every bait is able to be used in just how I want it coming out of the bag versus buying like a bag of 10 soft plastics. They're all thrown together in the same bag and then four of the 10 are bent or the claws are crimped or the tails folded from sitting, you know, in the package all whopper jawed and now half of them don't run right. That's a big thing to me. I want my baits to be perfect right out of the box. And so the other thing that's a big thing for me to be honest is the competitive pricing of these plastics. I mean, like, let's take like the Ned BLT, for example. You get 10 individually packaged Ned baits for $5.99. So that's like 60 cents each or whatever it is. And they're that insanely durable, elastic type plastic that everybody seems to want these days. And then meanwhile, go and compare that to another super stretchy, like premium Ned bait, like a Nico Bait Super Ned or something like that. Nico Baits are $8.49 for a pack of eight of them. So Rapala, $5.99 for 10. Nico Baits, $8.49 $8.49 for eight. So when you put it in perspective, I really like that these baits are competitively priced for regular people and they're not on this super high pedestal of premium priced soft plastics, which they kind of look to be the quality that you probably could charge a little more for them. So I do like that. So the next time that we talk about these baits likely will be after I have the chance to like fish these baits hard and then come back with a true review. But right now it's pretty exciting to see a new line of baits that was so highly anticipated finally hitting store shelves for the public. Uh, In other big like new bait news, the new batch of Berkeley call shads are finally out into the world. So if you remember, again, we want to rewind back to like the summer around ICAST time frame. Berkeley recalled all of their call shads due to a manufacturing issue. So we actually got the chance to go to ICAST to talk to Berkeley face to face in July about what that issue was. And I didn't really hear anybody else ask that or have it covered really widely out there in fishing media. People just were like, oh, they're recalling them. There must be an issue. We'll wait for the new ones. I didn't want to do that. You get the chance to go down there and talk to like the people. So I want to get the chance to sit down with them and say, hey, what was the actual issue? Like people want to know people that listen to the show, people in the fishing industry were naturally curious, right? What went wrong? We're not going to really hold it against you that much because you're fixing it. So the transparency of getting the chance to talk to them and figure out what the issue was, was kind of cool. And they basically said it was an issue with like the hardness of the plastic during the manufacturing process that arose from them trying to produce them too quickly after the popularity of them when they were shown on that major league fishing event earlier this year. And then everybody was like, oh my, my God, I need the call shad. The call shad looks awesome because it kind of dominated this event. So they sped up production, but kind of to their detriment, right? There were some issues that come along with trying to push production that fast when you're not quite ready for it. So they had some issues with the hardness of that plastic and there were call shads that went out that just, it wasn't the right dexterity of that soft plastic, whether it be the tail or the body or whatever it is. So to their credit, they recalled all of them. If you bought one of the old call shads that wasn't right, they had an opening on their website where you could fill it out. You just kind of had to take a picture. You didn't have to have your receipt or anything like that. You fill out your info and then they sent you new ones. So good on them, right? Fix your issue. Make sure that when this goes out into the market for the first time in a lot of people's hands, it's how you intended it to be and it fishes right. Um, But a cool little bait that we've kind of been waiting on for a while. It went out there initially and then it went away. Now the new line of those coal shads is finally out into the market. Um, I got the chance to fish one for a little bit last weekend and I'll be honest I liked it now obviously it's like a limited time frame I threw it for like one day but I caught a couple fish on it it was definitely fun to throw and I did like it in certain situations a lot better than something like a mag draft just for how I fish around here so cool little baits hitting the market right now the crush city soft plastics and the new Berkeley call shads the revamped ones that are actually the right formula of plastics are both hitting shelves right now All right, folks, the very next thing here, kind of in the Christmas spirit, I'm bringing back something that we did last year that everybody seemed to like. So starting today, December 12th, 2023, through the end of the year, through December 31st, I'm giving out free Tackle Talk decals to you guys, the listeners, for doing one simple thing. All you have to do, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review with a written comment. That's it. Once you do that, screenshot it and then either DM it to me on Instagram at Tackle Talk Podcast or shoot it to me in an email, tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com, along with the address that you would like the decal sent to, and I'll take care of the rest. 
completely free, no catch. I'm not capturing your info, right? I don't have time to write all this stuff down. Trust me, I'm not keeping your addresses or your info or whatever. I'm literally gonna write your address that you send to me on a white envelope, put the decals in it, mail it out, and then I'm gonna delete that message. So right now, all you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review with a written comment, screenshot it, and then either DM it or email it to me with the address that you want those decals shipped to. So if you want to support the show, it is like the easiest thing you can do. I'm not asking you to buy anything. I'm not asking you to give money or subscribe to some Patreon or something, right? If you want to support the show, really easy way to do it. Leave us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, screenshot it, send it to me over at tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com or Instagram at tackletalkpodcast if you'd like a cool little reward this Christmas. And if you can prove to me that you have an Android phone and you don't have the ability to use Apple Podcasts, right? If you're one of those green text people out there, just go to wherever you listen. So probably Spotify is the normal one. Leave a five-star review, screenshot it, send it to me, and I'll still send you some. I'm not going to hold it against you because you don't have an iPhone or whatever. So if that's your case, totally fine. I'll get you taken care of too. But again, go leave us a review, screenshot, send to me to get some free decals sent your way. All right, folks, next, we have a very interesting story out of Pennsylvania involving pro angler Dave Lefebvre. So here is a really quick snippet from an article that was recently posted by Jason Seelock. Dave Lefebvre posted three stories to his TikTok page last Saturday night, December 2nd, 2023, documenting the saga of his wrapped truck being stolen. He was at his church helping set up for a concert the next day and got the call on his phone asking if he had moved his truck. He went outside and found that his truck, in fact, was gone. The police were called and dispatched, and while taking his information, they got a call that they may have found his truck already. So the cops raced off, and within 15 minutes, Lefebvre was headed to where his truck was found. When he got there, police officers had informed him that the truck had been stolen by a homeless man with a record of stealing vehicles in the past. Lefebvre opened his truck to find the man had basically moved into his truck and was full of his belongings. The man stopped at a local convenience store where the folks knew Lefebvre and his wrapped truck, and when they saw that Lefebvre didn't get out, they called the authorities. Lefebvre goes through the process of identifying what is his and what's not his in his truck, and police were moved and bagged it all up. Then Lefebvre went through and did an inventory of what might be missing. The truck was dirty and already smelled bad. So Lefebvre no doubt had a hefty cleaning bill on an exciting Saturday night in Erie, Pennsylvania. So there you go. Just kind of a fun little story there. I guess, well, fun for us, not fun for Dave. But I guess the moral of the story here is if you're listening to this and you're a homeless person and you're looking to steal a vehicle, it would probably be wise to pick literally any other vehicle on the planet than a giant jacked up aqua blue wrapped Toyota Tundra with Dave Lefebvre's name on the side. You might want to pick something a little more under the radar if anybody listening to this is interested in taking part in some auto theft here anytime soon. So we're glad Dave got his truck back. Just a uh, real weird wonky story from the fishing world this past week. All right, we are going to get to the mailbag here in just a second. We have a ton of your fishing questions to get to, but first we are brought to you in part by Dakota Lithium Batteries. Dakota Lithium Batteries are the only lithium batteries that I trust on my kayak, whether it be for my motor or my electronics. They have never once let me down, and you guys know I am absolutely horrible on my gear, whether it's dropping those batteries off the truck tailgate, dropping them in the water, in the mud. I beat the tar out of my gear, and these batteries have held up every single time. That's because Dakota Lithium batteries are twice the power of traditional batteries at half the weight. They charge up to five times faster. They last up to four times longer. They have 100% U.S.-based customer support system waiting to help you, and they come with a whopping 11 years. Year warranty. So if you want the best batteries in the game and you want to save money, that's obviously what we're here to help you do too. We got you covered with 10% off your next purchase over at dakotalithium.com with code TACKLETALK10. 10% off your batteries, whether you need $100 worth of batteries, whether you need $1,000 worth of batteries, 10% goes a long way. We're here to save you money always. Code TACKLETALK10 over at www.dakotalithium.com, the official lithium battery of Bassmaster. All right, the first question here is from Jim, and he says, Hi, Andrew. Spinning rod question here. I'm looking to upgrade for next season, and I'm looking to go with two rods, one for bass and one for panfish. I like Fenwick, but I'm open, and my price range is under $150. I love the show, and I hope to see you at the Columbus Expo again this year. Jim. Well, 
Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing you here in a couple months in Columbus. Uh, as far as your question goes, I'm guessing you're talking about $150 each versus $150 total. So if that's the case, 7-1 medium fast HMG for $139 might be the way to go. If you like Fenwick, and especially if you like the old Fenwicks, you're going to love these new ones. I can almost promise you. So at 7-1 medium fast HMG might be the move. It's just right under your price budget at $150. And I would probably spend as close to that 150 as you can, especially on the bass rod, because I think, again, that 150 is going to make a big difference if that's going to be your one bass rod. So I'm not much of a panfish guy. I don't know too much about panfish rods, but if you're a Fenwick guy, you might look at the old HMGs at this point too, especially for your panfish rod, because they have some stupid cheap HMGs online right now. If you can find the old ones that they've discontinued, I know Shields is selling them for 79 bucks. They were normally 120 so that's a great deal if you like those old HMGs again maybe especially for that panfish rod you can get a steal on them right now um, other than that other choices for the bass rod if you want to go down the Dobbins line you can always go with the Fury that's a great safe choice or even right now because of the sales going on I might look at the 7-1 Dobbins Caden over at American Legacy Fishing. They're normally $180. Right now, they're $143. So you should be able to get a medium or a medium light, whichever one you want. Medium, a little bit more do everything with. Medium light, if you want something that's a little bit more finesse-y. Um, I kind of look at the lights and the medium lights with Dobbins. Like if it's exposed hooks, you're throwing a lot. Medium light is great. If you want something that can power through more like a Texas rig or a Texposed hook, then you're probably going to want the actual medium. But either way, 7-1 Cadence are awesome rods. I have a couple 7-1 Cadence that I love. You've probably heard me talk about them before, but right now they're a great choice at $180 normally priced, but an even better deal right now because they're $143 bucks over at ALF. So there's a couple choices for you to look at. I hope that helps a little bit. All right, the next question is from Jonah, and he says, My name is Jonah Conley, and I'm 13 years old. I just wanted to thank you for all the time and effort you put into this podcast. I can't tell you how much I've learned in the past year and a half. I started off using a Zebco spinning rod and a cheap bait caster that I found at a garage sale. Now I'm fishing two tournament trails, and I've upgraded my previous PB of 4.5 pounds to 7 pounds. There's no way I could have done this without Tackle Talk. I just wanted to say thank you. I'm also wondering if you could pick one to two baits that you've never used before to fish with for a week, what would they be? Basically, what are two of your bucket list baits? Uh, well, thank you, Jonah. That's awesome. First off, I guess I just have to say, we get questions like this all the time with people saying that they're like 12, 13, 14 years old that are so much more articulate and so much more advanced in their fishing skills than I ever was at 13 years old. At 13, I didn't know what half the words you just said in that question meant. So kudos to you guys. It's crazy to see the youth and kind of the young anglers out there that are taking this so seriously because you are light years ahead of where I was at your age. So that's super cool to hear in and of itself. But your question is actually kind of a tough one, I think, because there are so few baits or types of baits, I guess, that I feel like I've never used in my life. So that's a pretty short list, I think, for me to try and pick from. But one bait that I think would be really cool to fish is called a Roman made mother. And I just think it'd be fun to fish because it's so expensive. I would never in a million years buy one of these. They're anywhere from $500 to $1,200. They have ones that are solid wood. They're hand carved. They're just like awesome swim baits. But they have one that's called the Mother Chaser, I think it is, that's like 16 inches long. It weighs like two and a half pounds. It's solid wood. And it costs, I think, either $1,100 or $1,200. bucks. So I think that would be a whole lot of fun just to go out there and chuck around and work it and then even more ridiculous if you could get bid on it again i'll never in a million years drop twelve hundred dollars or eleven hundred dollars or whatever on a bait but a cool bait to throw nonetheless um the other one i would say is probably more old school i'd love to get a chance to fish like a old paycheck baits top water that was called the one and it was basically like an old skinny pencil popper that was made by i think the guy's name was bub tosh uh back in the day but the one is one of those baits that if you look on eBay, it still sells used for $100, $150, $200 sometimes, and it just looks like a normal skinny pencil popper. So this is something I'd love to go out there and fish and see what all the hype is about. Is this really a unicorn type bait?
debate or is it something that just you know urban legends spread throughout the decades and it kind of developed this cult like following that collectors now pay big money for i don't know but i think it would be really fun to go out there and play with it actually fish one and not collect it and set it on a shelf somewhere and see if it really fishes better than things that are on the market today All right, the next question here is from Kevin, and he says, Hey, Andrew, I'm considering switching to Braid on all my spinning setups. My question is, since Braid has such a smaller diameter, would you match the pound test to the rod rating or an equal diameter to the recommendation per the rod manufacturer? I have 15-pound suffix, but it's only 5-pound equivalent in terms of diameter, where my rod is rated for 6 to 12-pound. Would that be sufficient, or should I jump up in poundage on Braid to match the 6-pound diameter? So, again, I'm going to preface this by saying I don't know if this is like the technically right way to answer this. I'm sure there's someone out there that can go real, real in depth in this. But basically, to me, the way I look at it is for the rod in terms of specs, I think the weight of your lure is so much more important than the pound test that the rod suggests for line. So the suggestion of pound test for line, a lot of times I think, is just sort of something that correlates to what type of line you should be throwing for the weight of the lure that the rod was built for. So if you have a rod that was built for, you know, a quarter ounce down to three sixteenths ounce, it's going to recommend lighter line to throw on that because obviously you're going to throw lighter line on that light of a bait. So I think there's a lot more to the weight of the lure that you're throwing than the line. Because if you're throwing too heavy of a lure on that rod, you're going to snap that rod. If you're throwing too light of a lure, it's not going to cast as well. Meanwhile, if you throw too heavy of line or too light of line on that rod, nothing really happens in terms of the rod. It's not going to hurt the rod. So you're not going to like, you know, absolutely kill your guides or something. Your guides can stand up to any pound test that you have going through the guides. They have the little inserts or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's not really anything you're going to do to hurt that rod by using different pound test lines that are outside of the recommendations, I really wouldn't stress over it too much. I really think the weight of your lure is what you need to worry about in terms of matching it to the rod than it really is the line. As long as your line makes sense for the lure you're throwing, you're fine. All right, the next question is from James, and he says, in river fishing, what baits are you bringing with you? What are your confidence baits? What do you like to try? And what do you reach for when the bite is off? Love the show, love the interviews, and your Stratic Caden combo is a game changer. Thanks, James. Well, there you go. I guess whoever the question was maybe four or five questions ago, I think it was Jim. We have a Caden disciple here. So a plus one, I guess, for the Caden on your rod choice that you were making, you know, three or four questions ago. But to answer your question, James, what baits am I bringing with me to the river every single time? I'm always bringing a Ned. I'm always bringing jerk baits. I'm always bringing paddle tail swim baits. No matter what time of year, those three things will be with me. And then depending on time of year, I'm probably going to have top waters with me at least for half the year. So a popper, a spook and a buzz bait. And then lately, I've always been bringing a big jointed glide bait with me. Uh, And then other than that, I guess winter specific, I'm always going to have an Alabama rig with me unless I'm fishing from the bank. I'm not fishing a lot of Alabama rigs because they're going to get hung up a lot and you're going to lose a lot of money. But if you're in the kayak, if you're in a boat, I always have an A rig with me in the wintertime. Those are probably my most frequent staples out there on the river. And then my safety like confidence lure is always going to be like a two to three inch soft plastic paddle tail or boot tail swim bait on a jig head. You will not catch me leaving home without a boot tail or a paddle tail swim bait on a jig head, ever. No matter if I'm going to a lake, a pond, a river, a creek, whether it's winter, spring, summer, fall, I can promise you I always have a paddle tail swim bait on a jig head with me somewhere in my box or already tied on. Uh, And then what do I reach for when the bite is off? Uh, I think it's really easy to say Ned Rig. I think that's something, it's like a boring answer, but it really is something that it seems like on miserable days, especially here in the Midwest, you go with a Ned Rig. A Ned Rig is kind of like the break in case of emergency bait for a lot of us around here. So that would probably be my answer, even though it's not like super creative or anything. There's a reason that the Ned Rig gets kind of the reputation it does because it's going to get bit more times than not when everything else is kind of struggling a little bit, but it's just uh, not always the most fun thing in the world to throw. All right, the next question is from Nathan, and he says, Hello, Andrew. I started fishing in September after buying a small fishing kayak. I'm hooked to say the least. I found your podcast shortly after, and I enjoy the flow of your show and the way you present information. You are a talented podcaster. Keep up the good work. My first baitcaster was a seven-foot medium ugly stick with a Shimano Caius? Caius? I can't remember how to say that. C-A-I-U-S. 
reel. Next, I got a loose heavy pitching rod and matching reel. I needed a medium heavy, so when I heard you mention looking for deals on a Shimano Corrado K, I started looking and scored one locally for a great price. I put it on a 7 foot medium heavy Dobbins Fury, and after a couple outings, I must say it's destined to be my favorite setup. My question is, did I make a mistake with the Fury? Should I have gone up and looked at the $200 price range? Is there a rule of thumb for the ratio of the price of the reel to the price of the rod? Thanks and Merry Christmas, Nathan. I uh, appreciate it, man. Thanks for the kind words. The cool part about your question is I think you answered your question yourself. So if you back up, I should probably go back and look, but you said something along the lines of you love the Fury and it was destined to become your favorite rod or your favorite combo or whatever you said. And then you ask in the very next sentence, did I make a mistake buying the Fury? I would say, based on your question, obviously not. That's what it's all about, right? Finding a setup and finding a rod and a reel that feels good to you. So don't get so caught up in the price. And I would focus more on how that setup feels and fishes. There are plenty of people out there that you can talk to that will say they like something like a Fury better than, you know, a high-end Dobbins or even a medium-end Dobbins. I'm one of those guys, right? If you ask me my favorite frog rod I've ever used, I've said this on the show many times, it's a $129 Mag Heavy 7.3 Dobbins Fury. I would rather have that Fury model of that rod than the same model in a Champion or a Caden or even a Sierra. I would really rather have the Fury. I've gotten comfortable with the Fury. I know how it fishes. I know how it loads up. I know how long I have to wait to set the hook. I know how to fight those fish. I know where its weak points are and where its strong points are, where I like the leverage, how I like to hold that rod. There's a lot to be said for getting used to that rod, spending time with it in your hands, and then saying, you know what? I don't need to go up because I'm so efficient and so confident with this rod and this setup. So what you're talking about is kind of why I would probably probably stick with the fury versus trying to go up you found a rod you like you found a rod that feels good don't mess it up if it ain't broke don't fix it. So I would probably stay with that. Now, if you're asking most of the time, is there a rule of thumb in terms of ratio of price of the rod to price of the reel that you should spend? I'd say there's not a ratio, but there definitely is one of those that I think is more important than the other. I'm a firm believer that the rod is much more important than the reel. The rod does most of the work. The rod feels, the rod sets the hook, the rod launches your bait at the cast, the rod works the bait, right? The reel just reels. And yes, there are going to be certain techniques like deep cranking where the reel might have a little bit more importance than other techniques. Like if you're fishing a spook, right? I would argue the reel doesn't really do much of anything at all because you're working everything with your rod. But I would still say at the end of the day, the rod is much more important than the reel in almost every single scenario or technique that I can think of. So if you have to splurge on one, for me, I'm always going to splurge on a rod before I splurge on a reel. All right, the next question is from Bob, and he says, love the pod, just discovered it. This is more of a statement than a question, though. I love the show about Timu, and I've shopped there extensively. I, too, got the cicada lure, and mine does perform as advertised, though have I caught anything with it? No, not yet, but I haven't caught very much of anything to begin with. I do realize it's somewhat of a gimmick, though. However, I somewhat disagree with you, though, about some things being a knockoff. A great many things are made in China anyway and then shipped here and just repackaged and or the hook swapped out for better ones and sold at a higher price. I know you will disagree with me, but it's just my view. I just started fishing again after many years since my kids are mostly grown and gone and it's just me and my wife and we got back into it. We are eagerly awaiting the spring as we are in upstate New York and in winter now old bones and joints sometimes don't mix well with the colder weather. We are looking forward to the next fishing expo coming up here in February in Massachusetts to gear up for spring. Thanks for doing the podcast and keep up the fantastic work, Bob. Hey, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it a ton. Thank you for writing in. And you're right. I, too, get frustrated a lot of times with all the knockoff talk, and I know I've kind of vented on this show time and time again about it, but because the word knockoff means different things to different people. So some people, I think, use the word knockoff as it should be used, which is where someone is like maliciously infringing on another person's true proprietary intellectual property, especially if it's trademarked or it's patented. 
it. I think that is truly knocking something off. But then there's other people who use the word knockoff just to literally mean anything that looks like anything they've ever seen before. So I'm with you. I think the latter half of people, everything would be a knockoff to them at this point. That's just how the world is. So many baits are made in China and sent over here. And it's just a matter of does the company that buys them from China slap new hooks on them and a nicer package and sell it for $10? Or do they put it in a crappier package, leave the old hooks on it and sell it for five and move on? And I think it would truly blow people's mind how few places in China are making almost all of the fishing products that we all use. So you have different brands of line that are being made in the same factory 10 feet apart from each other, but people will swear that one line is better than the other because at the end of the day, when both lines are made, they slap one logo on one and one logo on the other. That really happens in the fishing industry. Or you have two reels that are made on the exact same assembly line in the same factory, except they slap two different color side plates on them and a different name badge, and then one is brand A and one is brand B from two different reel companies. It's just kind of the world we live in. But yes, your point is heard loud and clear. I'm with you on a lot of this stuff on the knockoff talk and how a lot of it would probably surprise people. All right. And before we get to the last mailbag questions here, we are brought to you guys in part by Arctic Coolers. And just because it's colder outside does not mean that you don't need a cooler this time of year. So whether you need a mug to keep your coffee hot as you're heading out to the tree stand or you're heading out to your cold truck to fire it up and wait for the windows to defrost or whatever, or you just need a cooler to take your drinks over to your buddy's house to watch the bowl games that'll be coming up or Christmas parties or the NFL playoffs or whatever it is, you deserve a good cooler that doesn't cost $10,000 because of four silly letters on the front just to be the same as everybody else has. Go with someone like Arctic. Those four letters on the front let everybody know I have the same or better quality as you, but I paid half the price. That's what I love about Arctic. Head over to www.rticoutdoors.com. Look around for yourself. You need a hard cooler. You need a soft cooler, drinkware, travel totes, whatever you need. Arctic has you covered at a price that both you and I can actually afford. So head over www.rticoutdoors.com. Check out the full line of coolers and drinkware. I promise they will not let you down. Again, Arctic Outdoors, www.rticoutdoors.com. Keep the adventure going with Arctic. All right, let's get to the next question here. It's from Jim, and he says, Hi, Andrew. I'm a boat and wade fisherman. Salt, fresh, conventional, and fly. I listen to your remarks about kayak fishing and the dangers of swamping your waders. I also heard you read a comment last week about always wearing a PFD. I agree, but I also strongly suggest wearing a good snug wader belt. It's a good insurance to keep the water inflow minimal or nothing if you take a spill. Add the PFD for even more protection, Jim. Uh, This is a really good point. I actually thought about this. I swear. I thought about this maybe two days or so after I released that last episode that was like two weeks ago. And I sat there and I said, you know what? I should have mentioned a waiter belt. And for those of you that don't know, they have belts that you can buy that basically go around the top of your waders to minimize the amount of water that gets in if you do fall in the water. So is it waterproof? No, it's not waterproof, but it does help tremendously versus your waders immediately filling with water and dragging you down or even just preventing water from getting in there and being unpleasant and freezing if you fall in water that's not over your head. So it doesn't have to be a true wader belt even. I know they sell wader belts, but you could even just go to like Walmart or Amazon or whatever and get a cheapo $10 belt that's a little oversized and you can put around you or one of those like more canvassy strap type belts that kind of loop through that little metal thing and not necessarily like a buckle but whatever you do get some sort of thing that can strap around your waist and that'll restrict the amount of water that can get into your waders if you do fall in especially if you're in a kayak or if you're in a boat with waders on so yeah jim great point wader belts are something that i think people should look into or know about if you're wearing waders out there on the water All right, the next question here is from Grant, and he says, Hi, Andrew, I just picked up a 7-1 medium-fast St. Croix Bass X rod along with a 13 Fishing C2 8-1 reel. I plan on using it for jerk baits and small crank baits, but I was wondering if it would be a good setup to throw blade baits and tailspins on this winter. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so I fish a lot of flooded quarries and reservoirs like Alum Creek and Hoover Reservoir. I mostly use bait casters. The only thing I really throw a spinning rod with is Ned Rigs and Light Texas Rigs. Thanks, Grant. 
Ooh, we finally get some blade bait talk here. Yeah, it's been a while, but this is heavy metal season. If you want to throw blade baits, this is a great time to do it. Blade baits get smoked this time of year. So yes, I'm here for this question 100%. My short answer to your question, Grant, would be you can, but I wouldn't. I know you said that you only throw Ned rigs and light Texas rigs and stuff on spinning rods, but I would encourage you to throw blade baits on your spinning rod for sure. And lighter tail spins that you're talking about kind of in this question too, also fall in that category. If you throw a blade bait on a spinning rod with braid, you just get like the absolute best of both worlds. You get insane casting distance, like mind-blowing, maybe spool yourself casting distance. It's crazy how far you can cast that piece of metal when you're actually using a spinning rod that's like a medium or a medium light. You can just launch that sucker to the moon, especially with like 10-pound braid on it. It's awesome. But you also get the sensitivity of braid, so you feel every single vibration of that blade in the water or when you jig it or yo-yo it or whatever, you can feel every time you have a little blade of grass on there that you need to rip off, you feel those fish way better than you would with something like straight mono or straight fluoro. It's just a much more pleasant experience all around. Plus, you get the give of that spinning rod that loads up so much more friendly with a double treble bait, especially when it's on braid. So the give of that spinning rod kind of balances out the unforgiveness or unforgivingness, whatever the word is, of braid braid and then it's just a great match so i would say even though you're wanting to throw these things on a casting setup i'd really really encourage you to try a spinning rod instead uh the next question is from andrew great name he says hey man i fish all the time and i mean all the time winter is coming and i'm still out there river fishing i have my go-to lures that catch fish but i'm wanting to catch more Currently, I'm using a Z-Man flashback, a rooster tail, and a Strike King double Colorado blade spinnerbait. Any tips? I mainly fish the rivers here in Indiana. Uh, hey, dude. Yeah, I would say that you're right on, right? It is definitely wintertime. We have had like temps in the 20s and 30s. The wind's been whipping. It's been just tough, kind of nasty fishing some of these days. So winter, I think, unfortunately, is officially upon us. So with that being the case, you mentioned the Z-Man flashback, which is interesting. Basically like a super micro finesse chatterbait. Um, you mentioned a small rooster tail and a spinner bait. So all of those will work. You've got the finesse type moving baits kind of locked up. You've got the Colorado blade spinner bait, which I really like in the wintertime versus willow blades. So you've got a good start with those three. Uh, if you're river fishing in Indiana, I think it's not too far off from what we would be throwing here. You're just one state over. So I would add a Ned. I'd add a tight, wobbling paddle tail of some sort, more of a boot tail probably than a paddle tail, and then I'd add a jerk bait. You're going to want all three of those for sure. The Ned, I've just been using Zoom beatdowns lately. They're cheap. They're effective. I love Zoom. Uh, I've been using them with an EWG Ned head that we make here locally ourselves, but you can find all kinds of like one aught EWG Neds all over the place. Any of them will work fine. Um, for the paddle tails, I'm obviously partial to our local Big Josh. He's here, but there are a ton of boot tail swim baits out there you can choose from. You just want something that's got a little bit more tight wobble, almost like a roll to it in the wintertime versus something that goes whomp, 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 like uh, Kai Tech or something like that that's got a big aggressive tail. You want something a little bit more compact. Uh, and then for jerk baits, I always like my Lucky Craft Pointer 100 SPs or my Smithwick Rogues. In the wintertime, those are two staples for me here in the river. So those are the things I would probably recommend. And then if you want a sneaky option, Zoom Super Fluke Juniors. So I hope that helps. And then the last question here is from Jerry. And it's a good one. He says, hey there, I love the show. Quick question for the mailbag. What is with all the Guggen hate? I see so much blind slander that never seems to have actual reasoning behind it. As a younger fisherman, what got me started was videos from Guggen and their crew. Before that, I sat inside all day playing video games or bummed around. I didn't realize that I could be out enjoying nature right here in my city. Does that hate come from grumpy old men that don't want younger kids ruining their sport? I thought we wanted kids to put down the phone and go outside. Why does it seem like the fishing community likes to slam anything that caters to the younger generation? That is a good one. That is a loaded question that I don't think we probably have 10 hours to go over, but you could write a book on the answer to the question you just asked. Um, since we're past the Swimmy Awards, uh, and those were last week, I'm going to stay above a lot of the drama here because that's not really our MO most of the time. But this is a problem across the fishing industry in general. Certain things or people, I guess, get what I call nickelback syndrome. 
So if you remember, and you probably don't because you said you're a younger fisherman, so this is probably a little bit before uh, your time, I would guess. But for those of you that do remember, Nickelback was a huge chart-topping band in like the mid-2000s, probably 2005, 2006 or so. You couldn't escape Nickelback. It was every song on the radio. It was Rockstar, Photograph, Saving Me. That whole All the Right Reasons album was giant. It was everywhere, every award show. They were selling out every concert that they played. They were objectively a very, very popular band. And then at some point, some nerd on the internet created a Facebook group Group called I Bet This Pickle Can Get More Likes Than Nickelback. And then all of a sudden, the internet decided that it was cool to hate Nickelback. And once something becomes cool to hate, there's no real coming back from it. So in the fishing industry, Guggen, I think, got the Nickelback treatment at some point. At some point, it became really cool to hate the Guggen guys. And by the way, I'm talking like the original Guggen Boys, so not this like weird group of, you know, 500 random in and out people they have in the videos now. I'm talking John, Alex, Andrew, uh, Rob, and Mike, I think were probably the original five there. And so many people watch their videos back in the day that now claim they didn't or would never watch Guggen stuff, right? Everybody did. When those four or five guys really came on the YouTube scene, there's a reason that they transformed the fishing industry from a dusty old tackle shop centered economy to online sales and target marketing of certain demographics. They were really kind of the pioneers for fishing on the internet, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. But when you're the catalyst for change, the old guard really hates you. And in the fishing industry, unfortunately, we are full of old guard type people. So companies have been around for decades and decades. Like when your grandparents were fishing, a lot of these companies were around. So when you had these companies that made their riches by selling to 60-year-olds that sat around the tackle shop and talked about that one five pounder they caught 30 years ago on a cream worm they don't like it when 17 year olds with gopros start filming themselves and getting more eyeballs and sales numbers than their favorite tournament anglers were so change is a really hard pill to swallow and instead of taking their medicine i think the rest of the fishing community really rejected those type of guys those guggen guys until they couldn't ignore them any longer and then by then it was just too late so That's my take on the original Guggen guys. I think when we look back 20, 30, 40 years from now, we'll really have a lot to owe to those four or five original Guggen boys because they truly rocked an old, rusty, dusty industry and forced all of these companies to get into the internet age. But with that comes a lot of people that are just resistant to the change and then obviously look down on anybody that's really pushing the envelope or doing something out of the ordinary that's worked for these old companies for 30, 40, 50 years. So there you go. I think that's probably like in a nutshell the issue with the Guggen boys. And it's kind of the same reason why a lot of people hated Ike back in the day, right? He was out there screaming on boats when this was supposed to be like, you know, a gentleman's game or whatever. Anybody that disrupts the old guard and kind of how things have been for generations is going to get some hate almost in any sport. Anybody who bucks the trend is going to be met with negativity. All right, that is our episode today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Appreciate each and every one of you that makes this show possible every single week. Remember, if you want to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, just leave us a five-star review, screenshot it, send it to me. I'll get some decals sent out your way. I appreciate y'all. Find us on Facebook, on Instagram, at Tackle Talk Podcast. Shoot us an email, tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com. We're on our website, tackletalkpodcast.com, and we'll see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 